Uh, thank you very much, uh, Greg, uh, Dr. Gilpin. It's very good to be here. I was here in uh, May of uh, 2016 uh, speaking to a group of students uh, like you, so it's good to be here uh, two years uh, later uh, and in very, very different circumstances in my own uh, personal life. The importance of um, the work you are doing, the seminar you are, you, you, you are having uh, in the three weeks uh, uh, that you'll be here is, I think, the acceptance and understanding that uh, uh, security and national threats have moved on uh, from the traditional uh, interstate conflict uh, to much, much more complex internal dynamics and internal choreography. For the majority of countries that you are coming from, your country is unlikely in the next 50 years to go to war with its next door neighbor. It's very unlikely that Eswatini will go to war with the Republic of South Africa. But it is very likely that there will be civil disturbance and civil commotion in Eswatini arising out of uh, uh, domestic uh, internal uh, contradictions. So in the books that uh, uh, we present before you, we seek to answer and address in decisive terms how to speak to the internal contradiction and how to address internal conflict. And in our respective view, we find two answers. Number one, in the first book, Making Africa Work, we speak to the issues of development. We issues we speak to the issues of a growing uh, population that will make Africa double up in the next uh, 50 years. And the challenge that that population imposes for internal uh, uh, stability. So we spend a lot of time in making Africa work in actually providing a copybook to African leaders, to African author authorities, on how to actually <clears throat> navigate the very complex uh, developmental uh, matrix. How do you create uh, jobs, for instance? How do you create sustainable markets anchored on sustainable growth rates, growth rates that include everyone, growth rates that are inclusive, growth rates that create uh, employment? How do you deal, uh, for instance, with the challenges posed by collapsed transport uh, infrastructure? How do you deal with the challenges posed uh, by an information uh, technology landscape that is backward and, 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 and primitive? So these answers are provided very systematically uh, in the book called uh, Making Africa uh, Work. And, uh, and uh, I was a finance minister in Zimbabwe between 2013, so 2009 and 2013, and I wish I did a book uh, such as Making Africa Work, because it does provide, in general terms, uh, answers to many of the issues that are bedeviling uh, our continent. But it became so self-evident when we were writing this book, when we were working on Making Africa Work, that there were contradictions. They were, we took it for granted that democracy was a panacea. But we found out that there were countries that were not necessarily democratic, but, but that were also doing extremely well in terms of the quantitative economic uh, output. So the question that we posed was, does it mean that democracy is irrelevant for the purposes of answering and addressing the basic human demands that our continent uh, uh, requires in that our continent uh, uh, faces. So we looked at a country like Rwanda, for instance, which in the last uh, 15 years has been growing in real terms at an annual growth rate of 6%. We looked at Ethiopia under uh, Prime Minister uh, Meles Zenawi, which again has been growing at fantastic terms, building high bridges, uh, dams and, 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 and roads. 
And we realized that, uh, yes, you didn't need democracy in order to, to, to grow. But that was a very dangerous uh, 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 you know, you know, proposition. So we began to interrogate the concept of democracy and, uh, in much greater detail. And that's what we do uh, in the book, uh, Democracy Works, uh, which is in fact a continuation uh, of the conversation which we begin in making Africa work. We define democracy in uh, Democracy Works as to mean a system of governance in which there's governance by the people for the people. We define to democracy to mean that there's consensus, there's a contract, there's a social contract between the governed and the governors. And the biggest threat that Africa faces at the present moment, the biggest threat in most of your countries, is actually the fact that, that those who are governing are governing without the consent uh, of uh, uh, the majority, the consent of the ordinary people. And to us, that, that will form the basis of the biggest threats in uh, the countries uh, that most of you uh, are coming from, including my own country, uh, uh, Zimbabwe. The biggest threat is coming from the crisis of legitimacy. The biggest threat is coming from the fact that those who are governing by hook and crook, by electoral shenanigans, by electoral authoritarianism, have managed to uh, capture a uh, state, uh, state uh, 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 you know, power. So in addressing the questions of uh, democracy, we had to demonstrate, and we found empirically through a very uh, close study, that those countries that we were termed uh, uh, more democratic, and here we used the Freedom House categorization of states that are free, and in Africa there are about uh, 10 of them. That include Senegal, that include uh, Mauritius, that include uh, uh, Botswana. And we found that these countries that had, that had regular elections, where elections are, are, are substantively free and fair, they also tended to be more peaceful. And this is important uh, from you as students of security and strategic uh, 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 studies. But more importantly, they also intended to be more productive in terms of quantitative and qualitative performance of the, of the economy. So there's a connection between democracy, sustainability, lack of fragility, and, uh, uh, and sustenance. That is the point we make empirically in the first three chapters uh, of, uh, uh, of, of this book. But we had to answer, we had to answer the question posed by countries such as Rwanda, uh, Egypt, uh, uh, e Ethiopia, that were doing well without, uh, without uh, a, a democracy. We found that the, the, what is called the Beijing model, uh, which is not a new model at all, at independence in the, in the 50s, uh, Gwame Nguruma argued that uh, Siki, the political kingdom first, and the rest uh, will follow. And that was basically an, an argument that uh, a democracy was a luxury, and a luxury that the African continent uh, could not uh, afford. And it's not an accident that so soon after independence, there was a whole movement, a whole narrative that saw the imposition of one-party states across uh, the continent, in Zambia, in Tanzania, in West Africa itself. But that was very short term, because very soon, those one-party state regimes mutated into military coups in both Ghana, uh, Nigeria, and a number, the, the, the number, the majority of African, uh, uh, African states. And once a coup happened, I always argue that uh, coups are like uh, 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 buses in London. You wait for one for uh, one hour, no, none comes, uh, but then four come at, uh, at, at the same time. So if you, take, uh, if you take Ghana, for instance, since 1966 to 1990, there have been more than eight changes of government uh, through uh, military coups. The same is not different at all uh, from, uh, from uh, uh, Nigeria. The same is not different at all from countries such as the Central African Republic, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and many of the countries that uh, uh, you, 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 you come from. So 
performance legitimacy, and I know uh, the good doctor here has written a book on performance legitimacy. By performance legitimacy, I'm referring to a situation where there is no contract between the governor and those to be governed, but those that are governing, having laid their hands on state power, seek to find legitimacy through economic performance. That is not inclusive, but economic performance that is expressed through high-rise buildings, through dams, through bridges. But it's not sustainable. Uh, it's not sustainable at all. What is sustainable is the case we make for democracy uh, in democracy works. And why, in fact, does democracy work? We make our arguments based on three critical things. The first one, which I've, I've already alluded to, that modern societies are founded on consensus, that modern societies are founded on the basis of the social contract, that modern societies are founded on the basis of trust and agreement. So when there's no consensus, there's no uh, stability. Where there is no consensus, there is no inclusion. Where there is no consensus, you set the base for permanent instability. And if you look at the landscape of Africa, <coughs> because consensus is missing, many of the states in Africa, about 22, you could describe them. And incidentally, those are the same states you found in category three of the Freedom House uh, classification. Uh, those unfree states, about 22 of them. And if you look at a common line in these uh, unfree states, whether it's Djibouti, uh, whether it's Zimbabwe, whether it's Mali, there's a common thread you find. Constant military coups, constant instability. You could also almost call them states in permanent crisis. States that will have a period of 15, 10 to 15 years of, uh, uh, of nominal stability. Then there is an implosion. Mali is a good example. Uh, Mali is a good example. Uh, Rwanda itself is a good example. If you look at the history of, of, of Rwanda, the Democratic Republic of Congo is another good, uh, uh, you know, in a, is another good example where uh, conflict is, is, is next door. Conflict is, 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 is so close by. You can go for 10 or 15 years of a law, but after that period, there is always an implosion. And again, you find that what is key is the absence of consensus. Uh, among citizens. The second thing that is key in democracy is that it is excellent in managing diversity. We come from diverse societies. Africa has got a population of over a, a billion uh, 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 people. We've got more or less the same population as China. But we don't have, China doesn't have the same languages, the same little uh, nationalities that we find in each of our countries. In Nigeria, for instance, there are people, there are over 400 languages that are spoken in, 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 in Nigeria. In my own little country, uh, Zimbabwe, the constitution recognizes 14 official uh, uh, you know, languages. So the best way of managing democracy is through, the, the best way of managing this diversity, these differences, is through uh, 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 you know, democracy. But it's not just a way of... Uh, it's not just a nominal way of presenting the population with an opportunity of voting on one day in five years. It must also involve the participation of these different diverse groups, which is why the modern African constitution recognizes one fundamental thing, which is the idea of decentralization, the idea of devolution, the idea of federalism. Because as long as you have got exclusion, as long as you have got a, a matrix that leaves a huge chunk of the population as innocent bystanders, then you have a problem. We speak about Kenya. One of the, one of the great weaknesses of the Kenyan matrix is the, the question of tribes. And the electoral process becomes a competition of tribes, not to save the people, but to eat. So each electoral contestation is a contestation of our time to eat, our time to capture the state, in order to uh, pursue and push the agenda of patronage and neo uh, patronage. So, if there has to be inclusion, inclusion must recognize the diversity, <coughs> and inclusion must carry everyone on board the smallest uh, 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 tribe, the smallest uh, lingu linguistic uh, group, it must be called in uh, into the status quo. The third thing, I've got five minutes, the third thing. Uh, that is key on democracy, is that it is self-correcting. 
But this uh, uh, matrix of the self-correcting nature of democracy only presupposes the existence of elections that are actually free and fair, that actually deliver. So if you've got elections that are free and fair, whatever incumbent knows that after five years, it fails, if it fails to deliver, it will be recalled. And we've seen in recent times in Africa, Ghana is, is a good example. Uh, Zambia, before its regress, another good example where you actually had in one African nation state a change of government, a change of party, it's an electoral uh, 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 process. So where you have an election that deliver, where you have strong institutions, you actually have the self-correcting nature of democracy uh, 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 playing out. But there is a depressing question and the depressing issue is that uh, Africa is taking too long to transit from firstly the, the unfree to the partly free and the partly free to the free. And in fact, if you carry out a balance sheet of all these three categories, you actually see a recession. You actually see a, a, a reversal. One of the said reversals is Benin. Benin was in the, in the, in the, in the free, free category. But events of the last few years have been depressing. The banning of uh, uh, political uh, 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 parties, the closure of uh, newspapers, uh, the refusal or boycott of political parties uh, to participate in elections. A very uh, disappointing situation. We are watching closely what is happening in Botswana, and we fear that there may be a reversal, uh, a reversal uh, uh, too. Zambia is another ex excellent example uh, of a reversal. We all celebrated in 1991 when the MMD under President uh, Frederick Chuluba defeated uh, uh, the UNIP, uh, the United Independence Party of Zambia, led by President uh, uh, Kenneth Kaunda. Uh, we celebrated uh, when uh, President uh, Chuluba was succeeded by President Levi Manawasa, Manawasa. and when Michael Sata defeated uh, 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 the MMD of President uh, uh, Rupia Banda. Uh, but since uh, uh, the takeover by President Lung, Zambia has been uh, in slippage and in reversal. I could say the same for Tanzania under John Pombi uh, Magafuli. Uh, so if you look at the second category around 19 states, the partly free, you now have a group of countries that nominally are democratic, if democracy is defined as regular elections, but it's the same political parties who have mastered the art of electoral shenanigans. So in fact, democracy is nominal. There's no substantive. So for 20 years, you find the same party being re-elected. And, and one of the sad things about African elections is that there is no connection between delivery and performance and the electoral outcome. So in my own country, in 2008, President Mugabe's government produced hyperinflation of 500 billion percent. But in the June 2008 election, President Mugabe was elected by 86 percent. So it seems that there is a contradiction in Africa. The more you fail, the more you steal, the more you get elected. And I'm sure those who come from the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, you'd agree with me. Those who come from uh, Burundi, you'd agree with me. Those who come from uh, Braza, Congo, Brazzaville, you'll agree with me. Those who come from Gabon, you'll agree with me. Those who come from Djibouti, you'll agree with me. So it's a sad a balance sheet. So the critical question that arises is, <coughs> why, is the <coughs> why has been these transitions been hijacked? Why has these transitions been delayed? Why have, been, have we had so many false starts uh, on the African uh, uh, continent. We were talking to American policymakers uh, yesterday here in D.C. And we were speaking to, to and interrogating the fact that why is there no Africa policy by the current uh, administration? Part of the frustration lies from the fact that the West has put and invested huge amounts of resources on the African continent pursuing the democratization agenda, but that agenda has been betrayed by these false starts, these uh, reversals, and these arrested uh, transitions. To me, in conclusion, what is key for the stability of Africa, for the democratization of Africa, 
beyond the election day itself. The election day itself is key. But what is key is what happens between the five years between the next, next election. And this, the following things are key. Number one, do we have strong, inclusive institutions? In most of the countries that we come from, there is a conflation between the ruling party and the state. And independent, normatively, independent institutions are but an extension of the ruling party. Whether it's the judiciary, whether it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, our parliament, parliaments are just the rubber stamps uh, of the executive. So to move forward, to make our democracy substantive, to create sustainability and deliver on the African continent, we need strong institutions. Number two, we need strong, sustainable markets that carry everyone on board, that are developmental, uh, 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 that are inclusive. So growing economies that are inclusive, market economies that are inclusive, they are key. Third, we need the rule of law, we need constitutions, but not just constitutions, we need constitutions with constitutionality. So that is very key. Because oftentimes in Africa, we suffer rule by the law and not rule through rule of law. So the third issue is very important. Number four, we need a very strong civic society, a vibrant, uh, buoyant civic society that can hold uh, the state and the citizen uh, to account. Lastly, the electoral system must actually work. In most of the countries you come from, the electoral, the electoral management system is captured. In many of the countries that you come from, there, there is no independent press. In the country that I come from, 39 years after independence, we have one broadcasting house and literally one a state a newspaper. So if we can address this thing, then we can unlock the grid block that has paralyzed Africa for the last 40 years. We have 22 states that are called uh, 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 unfree. And there is a number of countries that are moving from the partly free to the unfree. Look at the number, the increase in the number of military coups in the last two years alone. And speaking of my country, we had a military coup in, in, in November of 2017 that was bloodless and seamless. And I think the military people here, you are probably studying Zimbabwe and using Zimbabwe as a copybook of a fantastic military coup, if ever one can ever use that term. So we are in the recession. The challenge is how do we move forward? We move forward by addressing the key issues we address in making Africa work and in democracy works. I thank you very much.